Uh, but this is Headstrong Sports Psychology and Mental Skills Training. This is uh, an introductory session. Where I'm not trying to teach you mental skills or ways to teach mental skills through this. I'm trying to do is introduce you to the concept of them. Um, hopefully give you a little bit of background in sports psychology so you understand what it is and how you can integrate it into a community program because it, it is something that is important to incorporate into your sports programs and your sports teams and your athletes. And it's not as difficult to do as you want to think. With that said, anybody in here have any experience with sports psychology or mental skills training? No one? Well then, yeah, I do, and I know Ben does, so I, I guess I can't go wrong then, so if I make a mistake, nobody's going to know it. So. <laughs> ben won't throw it right now. <laughs> I don't think. Um, we have a couple pages of objectives here, and uh, as you look at this, uh, I do want to lay a little bit of groundwork for the history of sports psychology, because I think it's going to surprise you a little bit. I already talked about the need and benefit of uh, utilizing uh, sports psychology. We're going to talk about some of the myths that are out there that make people not pursue um, utilizing these resources. I'm going to go through some definitions to make sure you have good working knowledge of that and can communicate it to the other people in your program, to your coaches, to your athletes, to your coaching juniors, um, to the parents and those athletes because it's important for them as well. I want to know, you know, why do people engage? in sports psychology and health skills training. What are, what are the outcomes you're looking for? Um, and then how do you go about learning those skills? And what methods can you use? What different skills can you develop that are considered uh, psychological skills and health skills? And then again, hopefully by the end, you'll have a, you'll kind of be on board to get on the bandwagon. This is something that you want to incorporate into your programs. So the history. Uh, there's currently six periods of development within sports psychology that uh, date back a little ways. Why don't you, somebody start yelling out some years. When did sports psychology first come to be in North America? Come on, come on. 1960s. 1960s. A little, well, a lot earlier than that. 40. A lot earlier than that. 20 BC. It was before the 1900s. Wow. North America. I don't think we had what? 1895. 1895 was basically the start of sports psychology in North America. Norman Triplett um, was a sports psychologist and he was really interested, he, he was a cycling enthusiast and he had noticed that cyclists tended to race faster when they raced in pairs or groups than when they raced alone. And he found that interesting. So what he wanted to do is find out if that was he just that was an anomaly or that was something that was consistent. So we went back through race results and uh, found found that by comparing the times of cyclists, he knew that they did indeed race faster when they were in either in a pair or racing in a group. So I thought, well, I wonder if that can be carried over to any other endeavor. So he conducted a few experiments, and he conducted one where he had children, little boys, reeling in fishing line. And he had them do it by themselves, and he had them do it being observed by another child. And sure enough, when they were observed by another child, they would reel in more line in a given amount of time. So that was, that was kind of the beginning of just observing how psychology can affect physical skills. And that's where it began. And right about the same time, a young undergraduate at the University of Illinois, Coleman Griffith, Griffith began running informal experiments with the football and basketball teams. And the work that he started at the University of Illinois actually went on to define the second era of development in sports psychology. And it's actually called the Griffith Era. And uh, Coleman Griffith is known as the father of sports psychology in America. And he's the first American to dedicate the majority of his professional career to sports psychology. Um, and this is, as you can see, way back in the 20s and 30s. And keep in mind, when did psychology really start coming in to its own? Just general psychology, clinical psychology. It's the same time. You know, they were almost developing together a little bit. So for sports psychology really start developing in this time, to me it anyway, it's very interesting. And, uh, and Griffith did a lot of work. Um, and he didn't have a lot of other professionals that were pursuing this full time to 
to talk to, to conduct research with. So he was really kind of an, on an island doing this on his own. And the, the level of research that he did really set a standard for the field to grow to where we are today. And some of the things that he did, he didn't just work at the University of Illinois students. He consulted with the Chicago Cubs back in the 30s. He, uh, he corresponded with New Rocky, everybody know New Rocky? We went from the Gifford, famous football coach from the day. Communicated with New Rocky about how best to psych teams up. Um, <clears throat> he also interviewed Red Grange. Everybody knows Red Grange, football Hall of Famer. He interviewed Red Grange wanting to know, you know, what's going through your head when you're carrying the football? You know, what are you thinking? So this period, the first two periods were really, really defined by a lot of observation and measurement, not a whole lot of application. So we were getting people that were trying to define certain things, make observations, put some data to it, but they weren't doing a whole lot with it. Coleman is a little bit of an exception, but uh, um, he's also, as you can see here, he, he instituted the first academic sports psychology lab, and he wrote two books, The Psychology of Coaching and The Psychology of Athletics, way back pre-World War One. so got a big background. The third period of development, preparation for the future, starts getting us a little bit more in the modern times. And Franklin Henry um, was really the, the person that defined this area. Um, he, uh, he's credited as the field scientific, with the field scientific development that was focused on research in the psychological aspects of sport and more skill acquisition. But his most significant contribution to sports psychology was that he established this graduate program. Because what Franklin Henry did through that graduate program was educate a generation of physical educators who went on to become professors, administrators, and faculty that developed other programs that continued the work that Franklin Henry was doing and offered opportunities to learn and research in sports psychology at the university level. And what that actually led to the students that he was educating in California and the programs that they created is what actually developed kinesiology as a discipline. So he really did a lot of work and uh, um, brought us up to uh, um, laid some nice groundwork to continue on in the period before. And here we've got the establishment of academic sports psychology. And Bruce Ogilvy is one of the people that defined this area. And at this time, a lot of people that were in sports psychology um, were working in both sports psychology and, uh, and motor skill acquisition, and they did it together. And this is where the fields really started to diverge. If you were going to be a sports psychologist, you work on a sports psychology. If you are going to do motor skills, you were going to work on motor skills. You weren't really going to do the both. Do both. Uh, you were going to specialize. And so they started to separate here. And sports psychology at this time began to focus on areas of anxiety, arousal, self-esteem, uh, the personality effect of sport and motor skill acquisition and development. And what happened as sports psychology became uh, more uh, became more structured and definitive as its own discipline, you start to see more people taking an applied approach. Remember, we talked about those first few areas. There wasn't a lot of application being done. This is where people in the field of sports psychology became applied consultants and started working with athletes, coaches, and teams. And if you want to know what that big, long acronym down there is, that is the North American Society for the the psychology of sport and physical activity. So again, with this, we started to see um, some development of different conferences and associations as well within this period. Period five, almost getting up to modern times here with period five, and uh, we've kind of seen the foundation. We see, you know, how many of you thought the sports psychology went back to 1895? Did that shock everybody? Yes. I mean, it, it kind of shocked me too when I first read that uh, um, a long time ago. And at this point, we've got about 83 years of development in the field. So that's a long time. You know, Paralympics hasn't been around for 83 years. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, a lot of good things happened. And this period was defined by those four points 
uh, that we see there. A lot of international associations started to spring up. Sports psychology started to be taken more seriously. Um, uh, in Europe, uh, the Soviet Union was, did a lot of work. Unfortunately, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, a lot of the work they did stayed inside the Soviet Union. Um, I think we all can remember that they, they had and have great scientists, and they did some great work, but it didn't get disseminated because of that, that communist block block. But we really saw a lot of growth here. Uh, the public became more aware of and accepting of sports psychology as a discipline. Uh, and gained a lot of notoriety in academia. A lot more students were interested in pursuing the field. And what happened was a lot of people that uh, were pursuing general psychology started to become interested in sports psychology. And a lot of students had a background in counseling psychology and general psychology. And it, uh, it started to raise some issues about how do you properly transport psychologists? What, how do we go about doing this? What, what are the classes they need to take? What is the background they need? And as these different things were coming up, we still see some development here in the first journal of sports psychology in 1979. 1985, USOC hires its first sports psychologist. Um, I think they still only have one. <laughs> That's a joke. They have more than one, but the USOC, the USOC, and really American sport in general does not take sports psychology as seriously as other nations do. Here's a good example for you. In the Beijing Paralympics, uh, China, obviously the host country, how many sports psychologists do you think the Beijing, or the, excuse me, the Chinese Paralympic team as a whole had at their disposal throughout the games. The Paralympic team, not the Olympic team. Yeah, hundreds, three hundred. Oh, we got both ends of the continuum. Over, over eighty. The Chinese Paralympic team had over eighty available. No other. How many athletes? Oh, geez, do you remember that? The Chinese team that year. Probably around two hundred. At least. I believe in Beijing they had two. It certainly, I know it wasn't more than five, but I think it was two. Um, and a few years ago, um, when Ron Likens was the head coach of the women's wheelchair basketball team, he readily utilized the sports psychologist, and those women went on to win two consecutive Paralympic gold medals. Um, so that's, again, building the case for the resource. Jeremy, this quick question to you, but what would be the, I mean, why would the Chinese, why would the Chinese, why would they stay out based on the Chinese? Part of it's resources. I mean, they threw everything into those games. They, they were, you know, they were hosting the games. And they were not going to spare any expense to win medals and have a showing at the games and really build their foundation for the future. Um, I think when you look at sport globally, um, there's a lot of arrogance in the United States, and there's a lot of thought that uh, we're just the best, so you know, we're, we're supposed to be gold medals and we're just going to go do it because we're Americans. And I think we're seeing that that's not the case. You know, and there's a lot of science. And people, again, this is an introductory class, but if you really get into this, there's just research upon research upon research about how Sports psychology is a field and mental skills training enhances performance. And, you know, really, our Paralympic athletes, every athlete should have access to a sports psychologist because it really is part of a holistic, complete training program. And we'll get into a little bit of that in the future. Um, ASK, the American Association of Applied Sports Psychologists, started in uh, 1986. And the reason that's important is because they went on to establish a certified consultant. So they were the first entity to say, this is what you need to have as a minimum to be certified as a sports psychology consultant. And right now they are the standard if you want to be a certified consultant. I know of no other entity that certifies sports consultants. You can get degrees in sports psychology, you can get terminal degrees in sports psychology, but ASP is the um, entity that actually provides certification and keeps a database. Um, Another point of interest, the American Psychological Association developed Division 47 uh, for sports psychology in 1987. And let's see. 
And that brings us to current day and period six. And you can see this is contemporary sport and exercise psychology. We had exercise psychology in period five, and that's when exercise psychology was really developed. And now you don't really hear sports psychology, you hear sport and exercise psychology. And some programs have deviated. Georgia State, for example, has a doctorate in exercise psychology that really doesn't bring in the sports psychology perspective. They're really more interested in just determinants of psychology and physical activity and not sport performance, which is where sports psychology comes in. Um, it has a great future. Um, there's still debate on how you best train and educate students. Exercise psychology, because again, it's about determinants of uh, physical activity and psychology, and there's a lot of money for that, a lot of money to prevent obesity and promote wellness. So universities are, are uh, creating programs because they can get funded through a lot of sources and they can be self-supporting to have those types of programs. And Division 47 recognized sports psychology is specialized in the area. And there's still a lot of debate. Uh, if you want to Google sports psychology, you're going to find people that say it's, you know, it's not based on it doesn't work. And everybody can have their opinion. Uh, as a coach, I'm always looking for an advantage. And I've had enough experience with this that I know how athletes have done correctly. Is it going to work the same way for everybody? Absolutely not. Is it going to get into some of that in a little bit? But um, you know, be careful what you read. I tend to, I probably read, I think Matt Holmes probably watched me read four textbooks just on trips to basketball games on sports psychology. I don't know how many journal articles, but I try to get as much as I can to use what I can to apply to the needs I have for my athletes for myself. You know, I try to use sports psychology for myself any chance I get. Any questions on any of that? History and development? Do you have to get to the side? If you want to call yourself a sports psychologist or sports psychology consultant, you yes. If you want to call yourself a psychologist, you need a term of degree. But if you want to be a performance coach or a mental coach, no. we'll talk about that a little bit. Hopefully I won't miss it. I know because that's a nice little bit on there. Anything else on that before we get into this? So we're going to talk about this, but before we get into that, you'll notice I, I titled the session Sports Psychology and Mental Skills Training. And you'll find a lot of textbooks that use psychological skills training instead of mental skills training. And here, you know, PSD versus MSD, they, they're interchangeable. It's the same thing. They talk about the same types of skills, the same way you acquire them, the same people use them. I tend to use mental skills because as you get into the middle, you see where this comes in. But psych, when you use the word psychological, Especially when you're talking about um, helping an individual athlete, there can be negative connotations there. If you use mental skills training, um, unless you're in the mid-80s and calling somebody mental, there's really not that negative connotation there. So it can be accepted a little bit more readily and easily. easily. And it also opens the door to learning client role. How many of you have heard of life coaches or executive coaching? you know what that is? Sports psychology applied to the business world. The exact same stuff. All of that was learned and developed through sports psychology programs. Yeah, and you can make a little bit better money coaching executives than you do athletes, depending on the athlete. Yeah. Um, the, the myths. Psychological skills training. No, and the other thing I want to know I'm using psychological skills training here. As we go through these, just in your mind, Substitute mental for psychological and see how, if it rings a little bit differently for you when you read it. Psychological skills training is for problem athletes only. How many people have heard that or thought that or kind of seen that some, you know, the problem athlete? You know, the, the, I, think, uh, I think psychological, I think a clinical psychologist, sports psychologist would be good for Carlos Sobrano. <laughs> He's a problem athlete. But uh, sports psychologist. Psychological skills training, mental skills training isn't for the problem athlete. It's not for the athlete with a severe emotional disorder. That's really what a clinical psychologist is for. And if you're an athlete with a severe emotional disorder, a clinical sports psychologist should be dealing with that athlete because they have training, obviously, in psychology and in sports sciences as well. But um, mental skills training is for everybody. You know, it's not for, if you want to use mental 
technical skills training, you don't do it when the problem manifests itself. You use special skills training so you can avoid problems in the first place. Psychological skills training is for the elite training only, the elite athlete. Totally untrue. I mentioned a little bit earlier. Little leaders should be exposed to mental skills training. It's not just for the elite athlete. At the elite level, day to day fluctuations in performance can be attributed primarily to the mental aspect of the sport. But there's also skills that need to be learned at a young age because they are skills. They need to be learned. They need to be practiced. And the earlier athletes are exposed to them, the better chance they have to master those skills. How many hours does it take to master a skill? No matter what the skill is music, athletics. 10,000 10, hours. 10,000 hours, 10 years of systematic, consistent practice. Well, if you don't expose an athlete to mental skills training until they're 20, happens to be exposed to number six. And you have good parents that aren't going to push them and them up. That's a pretty good, well-rounded, healthy athlete by the time they're in high school. A good plan and a realistic goal of achieving the professional aspect of success. I mentioned a little bit earlier, PST provides quick fix solutions. Not true. Systematic, consistent vision is what produces change to mental skills training. It's not there to fix something right now. There's a show on, I can't remember what it's called on USA Now, it's about sports psychology, and it kind of, if you watch it, um, I think they do a good job of portraying what sports psychology is, and she goes on to say that it's not a quick fix, and I can't change an athlete overnight, but if you watch the promo, that's kind of how they show it, if you can involved. But if you've got, uh, you know, let's take Shaq, for example. Everybody familiar with Shaq? If he did a free throw, Save his life. You know, you don't bring a sports psychologist in the night before the NBA championship start to get Shaq, help Shaq make free throws. It's not going to happen. But if you start with Shaq in the offseason, if he had been working with a sports psychologist, he probably could have increased his free throw percentage significantly if he was dedicated to the process. PST is not useful. Uh, that is a myth, and hopefully, when we're done with the presentation today, you'll agree that that's a myth. Again, yeah, there's a lot of research on it. We'll talk about some of the different things. But uh, I, mean, well, I can tell you just from personal experience that it can be useful. Um, and it's not magic. It is something that you have to dedicate to. You have to research a little bit about it. You have to understand. And you have to be committed to communicating its value and its process to the people you're exposed to. If you do those things, you're going to see some results. So we get into what is sports psychology. And you've got the definition up there. And sport and exercise psychologists try to identify principles and guidelines that are professionals. And who are those professionals? In some cases, yeah. But all you just want to get that. You're all those professionals. Sport and exercise psychologists identify principles and guidelines that professionals can use to help adults, children, participate and benefit from sport and exercise activities. And all of us are here because in one way or another, our professional lives revolve around helping people with physical disabilities engage in sport, recreation, and physical activity. And if we take the definition at face value, and it's easy to see how we can apply that to what we do. You know, the scientific study of people and their behaviors in sport and the practical application of that knowledge. So basically, you know, we've got some other people out there doing the scientific study and publishing it. It's there for us to read and read it in a way where we're thinking about ways we can use that information to help the people that we work with. Well, what's, what's the objective of sports psychologists? We saw the definition, but what are they trying to accomplish through that? And really, when we talk about the objective, we're looking at two sides of the same coin. On one hand, we want to understand the effects of psychology on physical and motor performance. And then on the flip side, we want to understand the effects of physical activity on psychological development, health, and well-being. And you see a couple questions there that kind of uh, reflect how those questions, some of those questions would be asked within those two objectives. So we've got these two objectives. But why does sports psychology do that? Why do they want to get into 
that field? Why do they want to pursue those two objectives? Well, because they want to understand the health. Who do they want to understand the health? Elite athletes, children, persons who are physically or mentally disabled, seniors, and average participants. Who doesn't fit into that? Anybody? Right. So they're, they're, they're seeking knowledge that's going to help anyone. Anyone at all. Not one specialized area, not one sport, not an elite athlete, not emergent elite athletes. Anyone and everyone under the sun who wants to participate in physical activity, whether it's going out and having fun on a Saturday or training for the Maryland Games. What do they want to help them achieve? Maximum participation, peak performance, personal satisfaction, and development and participation. When we think about physical activity or sport, what else is there that doesn't fall into that? You know, you don't want to make sure you're engaging fully in all the opportunities you have, getting peak performance, enjoying what you're doing. If you're a weekend runner, you know, there's some sports psychology involved. There. There's some mental skills in there. How long are you going to continue to run in your own if you don't enjoy it? How often is it just, just easy to go out there and pound those miles away? You know, there's certain things you can utilize with your mental skills training to help you get through that and enjoy it even more and get more motivated and stay consistent. Well, how do they go about doing that? There's basically three roles that sports psychologists can have. They can be teachers, consultants, engaged in research. A lot of sports psychologists who are teachers obviously also engage in research because they're probably employed through university. And within those three roles, basically have two specialties. We touched on these a little bit. On one hand, you have a clinical sports psychologist. And again, that's a person typically with a terminal degree. It could be someone with a, a licensed professional counselor, counselor as well as trained to work with people with emotional disorders. And then you have your educational sports psychologist. So the question earlier was, do you need to have a certification to do it? Educational sports psychologist, also known as mental coaches. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I honestly would consider myself a coach. Um, I've, again, I've just I've read head nauseam on it. I've utilized it with teams. Um, I'm in no way, shape, or form an expert on it. I wouldn't go out there and call myself a sports psychologist. But I can't help an athlete do better and help them learn mental skills and processes by which to learn and develop those skills. Any questions on that? So you have to be certified. So yeah, uh, clinical sports psychologists are typically licensed by state boards. Generally, they're going to have a terminal, a, terminal, a terminal degree in clinical psychology with additional training in the sports sciences. That's the, that's the, that's the typical clinical sports psychologist. And you know, the, the interesting thing, uh, I, I kind of went over when we were talking about the different areas of development, or the periods of development, but there are programs out there um, at the master's level for sports psychologists that offer uh, a concurrent um, program where you actually get your LPC license, licensed professional counselor certificate and you become state certified. And when you think about that, if you're going to go into private practice, you know that's a that's a very valuable tool because now you can work with a more broad clientele. You don't have to work with just athletes. You can counsel just the general public. It also gives you insight into those things. Even if you're gonna, even if you're gonna work as an educational sports psychologist or a mental coach, you still need to have the ability to refer clients to clinical specialists if you see that they have that need. Um, you should never, I mean, you should never try to do more than what you're trained to do. Um, and that really comes in when you talk about educational sports psychologists and mental coaches. You're not trained to deal with, with emotional disorders, severe disorders. Trained to be a performance enhancement coach is what it really comes down to. So, what is mental skills training? We've got that, issue, that definition up there, and I've already said it a couple times. But the key is systematic and consistent. There's no quick fixes. Mental skills training, you need to look at it as just like you're developing any other physical skill. If you want to be an elite wheelchair basketball player, you can't go out there and do your physical training once or twice a week. You need to do it every day. 
if you want to really engage in that skills training, it needs to be something that's part of that physical skills training. It needs to be consistent, systematic, and you need to use it every single day. When we think about mental skills training, hopefully what, we're, what you'll be doing after this is we'll think about performance enhancement. And uh, how many people watched the track and field world championships a couple weeks ago in Big U? South Korea? No, that's awesome. How many people <laughs> how many people are familiar with the same bolt? World record holder in the hundred meters and two hundred meters, right? Um, how many of you heard that he false started and was disqualified? I believe it was in the semifinals. And there's a big there's a big to do because the IAAF changed the rule last year. It used to be it used to be you personally would get two false starts before you were beaten. Then they changed it where the first false start went to the field and any subsequent false start that athlete was disqualified. Last year they changed the rule. You don't get any freebies, no mulligans. You false start, you disqualify. There was a lot of talk when that happened. What happens if one of the top runners false starts? It's going to ruin the race. And lo and behold, here we are in the World Championships. Got the fastest runner on the face of the earth on two legs, two, two full legs. Um, false starts in the semifinals. Doesn't even get to race for the World Championship. And he's by far and away, I mean, he was going to win by three, four strides. He didn't need to, he didn't need to fall start, but he did. Do you think when he gets on the blocks in London, that might be going through his head? Well, how can you ensure that that doesn't go through his head? You know, that's part of the process. And whether he has a sports psychologist for himself, or he engages in these on his own, He's going to be doing some things to ensure that that's not what's going through his head when he's on those blocks. He's going to go through a process that's systematic and consistent that's going to put him in a mindset that when he's on that block, all he's thinking about is the process. I believe I missed, I missed it. I missed it. I watched it. I missed it. 200. But I think he came back and said the world record was 200. Yeah. Uh, he like, say 400. Yeah. yeah. So, but again, this is just, you know, the systematic and consistent practice of mental skills for the purpose of enhancing performance, increasing enjoyment, and achieving greater sport and physical activity satisfaction. And that goes all the way up to the end of So what's the objective of mental skills training? To assist the participants in the development of mental skills and achieve performance, success, and personal well-being. And I ran another one here. This is a separate definition from a different source, but I like this. Ten athletes basically affect, uh, function effectively on their own. To get them to a point where they master these skills, where they don't need an outside source, whether it be a sports psychologist, consultant, a mental coach, or a coach, helping them all the time. How many of you, how many of you are involved in team sports? How many of you are involved in basketball, wheelchair basketball, or otherwise? How many of you, whether it's basketball or other sport, have seen that coach on the sideline that never shuts up? Hot <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Barking out every single cue, every single direction to the athletes. Well, you know, that's not coach for the job. You know, you athletes, in order to perform, need to be able to think for themselves. Your job in practice is to teach them the skills, not only the technical and tactical skills, but the mental skills to recognize cues and react to those cues. And mental skills training can help you do that. Um, you really want athletes to be able to think for themselves. And if you're constantly giving, giving them direction, you're not giving them the opportunity to learn. And part of what mental skills can do is help them focus on those relevant cues in the game so that they can make the right decisions. You've all heard of being in the zone. And part of being in the zone is not thinking at all. You've got to the point where you have complete focus on what's going on and the ability to recognize and react to properly relevant views. Because as we found out, there's a lot of different things that can go on to distract you. One of uh, my former athletes had this great saying that uh, when he played younger athletes, they'd have the squirrel syndrome. 
He's the biggest guy on the court in the dealership room. Let me know him. Jason Van B. He sits in a chair almost as tall as I stand. And he would he had this uncanny knack when we played college teams with teams with younger players where he would just literally at a snail's pace roll down the middle of the lane, set up, and then there's no way you can they get a pass to score. I'm like, Jason, how do you do this? Well, these kids are around the side, they just see a score. It's like, oh, score them. They go chase the score like a stupid dog and forget about the relevant cube that's the biggest guy in the court that they need to keep out of the key. So that's one of the things that uh, mental skills can do is help you achieve this. The other thing I want to note on with this is that mental skills training is an individual process. You can have teams develop mental skills together, but no two teams are going to have the same type of program because no two teams have the same type of resources, time allotments, personalities, um, and no individual, two individuals have that either. It's a very individualized process. And if you attend my session later today, planning and goal setting, we talk about utilizing the resources and deciding, you know, establishing your priorities. And it may only be that you want to focus on one mental skill a season. That's still better than nothing. Why don't you talk, why don't you talk about uh, coaches that never set up? I know about I don't have an opportunity to talk about it. <laughs> so uh, I had four seniors last year. They really knew the game, growing up in the game. I really need to say no, this year is really a good idea. That's nice for you to team at that point, isn't it? It's, really, yeah. it's a really fulfilling feeling. Because really, when, when you can sit back and the only time you really talk is at timeouts or halftime where you're just you know, you know, giving information on what type of play you want to run and not directions all the time, it's very satisfying because that, you, you know that you've trained the team well and that they've gotten it and they're performing. And, you know, it's not some, what I found too with younger coaches, with that, I'm kind of getting on the nose a little bit, but younger coaches tend to do all that talking because they feel they're not, they're not doing their job. And that gets back to a coaching development uh, issue, but, and coaches do need to talk, but you need to talk in practice. You need to communicate the right way, and you need to provide proper feedback, and there's ways to do that. And, and uh, I think I've got a webinar on ways to even talk to, about some of that. And that's one aspect when those skills training comes in where a coach can use it, where you're focusing on the right things and being aware of not only what you're doing, but how what you do affects your team. Because sometimes when you lead as coaches, we don't feel too good what makes us feel good, not necessarily what's right for that. Um, if you want to talk about the mental for example, in our area, the coach still now doesn't work to be clean with nobody. You know, uh, for example, the behavior of the team, the coach was moved from office because he said on the first he doesn't talk. He just can't be the boss of the situation. You know, he's well, always working with them. Does the team win, though? Does the team win? Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, so when he got to the semi-finals, he was speaking out of the kids and he got them. He said he's not working because he was not shouting at the players. He says he has finished whatever he has to do with them. He says that he wants to do it. But he used that one to move him out of office. Well, that's true. 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 Well, and that, unfortunately, the professional level, that's going to happen. And that's why you do see a lot of, I mean, you see Coach K yelling all the time. Do you really think his players don't know what they're supposed to be doing? You know, and I heard I had a conversation with a college coach last week actually, and and he he brought a lot. He made an interesting point that when you look at uh, Division One college athletics, football, and basketball, the money comes into the university not because of the team, but because of the coach, and because of that, the coaches know that those dollars in their job are tied to how they're perceived. Like you said, the more they're out, the more they do, the more focus is on them. It keeps that cycle going. And that's an unfortunate reality of professional sports. Um, and I'm sure there was some political things involved in that. Uh, but you know, that's where people need to be educated and understand that you know, coaches, during a game, a coach shouldn't be the one giving all the directions. You want to give guidelines. If you have a good game plan, you shouldn't really be doing all the other things. Now, when you look it down to the little juniors and developmental leagues where you actually have a coach on the floor, that's a little bit different because you're doing different things. You teach, it's a different method of teaching. But when you get into the competitive athletics, it's 
a little bit different story. And you're really not helping your team to learn because ultimately, coaches are teachers, and you want your team to be able to go out there and function on their own and learn from their mistakes. And there's a great book out there called Mistakes Worth Making. I would recommend it. Cameron, the author, off the top of my hand, in my head. But, um, we're a little bit fortunate in wheelchair basketball in that the only time it really matters in the news is the national championship tournament because this is one and done. You're out of the camp. It was a game, you can't win the national championship. So I was I was afforded the opportunity always to treat the season as a as a learning process. So our goal was always to do better than we did at the game. And as long as that happened, we were good. I was good with it. Um, we've got to be a little bit strong with that philosophy, but uh, it, it works out well uh, because it, it allows it puts the players at ease and allows them to feel like they can make mistakes. And they can learn from those mistakes so that they don't make them in the future. If you go through a whole season like that, by the time you get to the end of the season, you made a lot of mistakes and you learned from a lot. And the players have the confidence that you have confidence in them. So, why is mental skills training important? How many people love yogiisms? I love yogiisms. I, I, I think I have one other quote in the end of here, and I, I use them all the time. But he was quoted as saying baseball is 90% metal. The other half is physical. Well, obviously you can't have more than 100%. But, you know, this is kind of pertinent for this discussion because, uh, let's see, who am I going to pick on? Uh, go, man. What's your sport? How much of it is metal? Give me a percentage. I'll say 50. 50? Somebody else, what's your sport and how, what's the percentage? What percent of success can be attributed to the metal side? How much? Ninety percent. Anybody else? Yeah, that's ninety-five. Jimmy Connors fan. <laughs> actually, actually, I have a poll for Jimmy Connors. He, he's poor as saying tennis is ninety-five percent metal. Golf, figure skating, tennis. Typically, coaches, athletes will say eighty to ninety percent, ninety-five percent metal. Pretty much any other sport, you'll never hear anyone say less than fifty percent metal. Well, 50% of the game success depends on the mental side. Don't you think we should spend a little time working on that? But that doesn't happen. Um, so you coach? Yes. So well, I used to. Okay, well, when you coach, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are you going to answer my session? Yeah. 50% <laughs> of the game success. 90% of the game So you spend 90% of the practice on mental skills. How much did you spend? At practice, it was more 75%. So 25% you spent on mental skills? Yeah. And then you got to be able to perform whatever skills we teach at practice. they got to be able to put that into the motion on field. I can't, as a coach, tell them what to do. Well, and then you get the mental part of the recall. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right, let's talk about. Um, got an athlete, you get done with the game, and you've got an athlete that obviously underperformed. You know, I just, just wasn't up for it today. So what did you do in the next practice to make sure that that wasn't going to happen the next time to resolve my performance? Anyone? Anyway, we've all had that, right? We've all had that one player that just, just. It's more physically, like you said. Oh my god, that's exactly what I have down here. Yeah. Most coaches, no one else tries to get a little bit of a skill around. Right. 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 And there are mental skills that need to be learned in practice. You know, we'll get into some of those in a minute. But the point I'm getting at is all of us as coaches, as athletes, realize that the mental aspect can contribute to at least 50% of our success. But none of us spend 50% of our training time devoted to developing those mental skills in the game. 
and even the lead athletes don't spend 50% of it. They spend far more time than non lead athletes doing such. Sorry? Sure. I, I, I think that you can think someone is right and make a good thing that physically they're not able to operate. Well, I think, I think as coaches, that, that's almost our job. Our, our job is coaches. Is to have athletes achieve a level of success that they weren't even aware they were capable of achieving and probably weren't capable of achieving without us. And part of that is the mental side. At the most basic level, is getting them to realize that they actually are capable of A, B, C, or D, whatever it is. And um, you know, I'm sure you've all <coughs> seen that in little glimpses. And the mental skills training is one of those things that kind of really can open up a whole new level of that for the coach and the athlete and the team. Mental toughness. Um, how important is the mental toughness in athletics? Yeah. No, I'm, just, I'm just looking for the nods. Everybody's still awake. Yeah, it's important. It's there. Um, two different studies of elite athletes and Olympians, gold medalist Olympians, found that they said that mental toughness was a prerequisite for athletic success. Now, think about that for a second. A prerequisite. Well, that doesn't mean that you develop mental toughness through success. It doesn't mean that the, the chicken came before the egg. You don't just have success, and through success you develop mental toughness. It's a prerequisite. You have to develop that mental toughness in order to achieve the success. Well, how are you going to go about doing that? You're not going to do it through the competition. You've got to do it some other way. But don't you develop mental toughness? struggles with it and and 
it seemed every single tournament I'd have to, he'd have an issue and I'd have to deal with it. And, uh, and it was a year we were having a lot, a lot of success. We, we hadn't had much success at, the success at the beginning of the year, and I really started to doubt my philosophy of just continuing on moving, we're going to get there. And we finally broke through. And, and Jeremy's sitting here and broke through because we beat his team at their home gym. And that never happens. You never beat Charlotte and Charlotte. It doesn't happen. And we beat them. And it was amazing. And everybody was happy. And we go out to eat. And it was my birthday, too. And so it was just awesome. I and I, yeah, I mean, it was great. I mean, it finally, you know, we, then I got to see all these months of work finally come to fruition. We saw where we were going to go for the rest of the season. We started the season on rain. That got us right in the top ten, I think. And we were all excited. We're going out to eat. And we're, we're walking up to the restaurant. Um, this player comes up to me and he says, I need to talk to you about my money now. <laughs> we just, I mean, you know, Matt, was, at that time, at least for the last 10 years, probably the biggest win the program had, wasn't it? And I got a player worried about me. And a few months later, we're at Pioneer. We you know, we were at Bluegrass a month later. He did the exact same thing. And I thought, my God, you know, I was so frustrated. I was like, I, you know, this is my coach. Happy with winning and doing all these good things. But then I changed my mindset. You know, I got a little bit more focused, a little bit more persistent. And what I realized was what helped me be the coach I was for him was that I could sit back and deal with that situation in a way that helped that athlete rebound from it and perform for himself and for the team. What I wanted to do was curse him out six ways to Sunday. <laughs> that would have made me feel a lot better. But once I kind of changed that my mindset on that and realized that that's actually one of the things I'm good at that sets me apart from other coaches, I can take pride in that. And I could look at that situation and instead of getting upset about it, I could put it in perspective and realize this is an opportunity for me to help the athlete and the team. I wish I could tell you that we went on the <laughs> turn 180. He did, but we got through the season and we finished seventh in the country, I think, from not even being ranked at the beginning of the year. Um, but it was something that helped me because I was able to kind of step back and use some of these skills and talk about in a few moments to help me analyze the situation and do what was going to be best. And you're not going to help every athlete, but you can't control how you look at the situation and how to handle that situation. All right, getting back to mental toughness. So, again, one of the things I want to do with this session is have you guys really embrace the fact that this is something that can be useful. So we've all agreed that the mental aspect of any sport, any endeavor, is at least 50% of the success. And that mental toughness is one of the most important aspects of winning. Well, if that's the case, Why do they not engage in? Why do they not go out and seek information from these skills? Well, there's three basic reasons why people don't do this. And the first is a lack of knowledge. In lack of knowledge, um, there's two areas where we need improvement. First, it's about what mental skills training really is. And hopefully after this, we'll have rectified that with you. You'll have a really good understanding of what it is, what it can be, and how it can be incorporated in different things. Uh, the second is a little more difficult. It involves how to actually teach the skills to others. You know, and that's something that just, it takes a lot of effort on your part. You know, I, I told you that Matt probably, Matt's probably watched me do four textbooks. Was I exaggerating? No. Probably more than that. Um, I read a lot. And I'm really interested in sports psychology, not just as a coach, but I just as, if I, if I could not be doing what I'm doing right now, I'd be a sports psychologist. I mean, I'm not going to stop and change. I don't want to do that much what we're doing. Somebody said, Dan, you can't work at Blaze anymore. I would I'd go up to the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and I would get in the doctor's program for sports psychology. You don't need to be that crazy about it. And there are tons of books out there. Terry Orlick is an excellent, excellent, excellent author. He wrote In Pursuit of Excellence. There's some great stuff in there. I'm going to have two references up on the slide at the end. There's some uh, really, really good resources. They're a little pricey because they 
from their textbooks. But it's a very good analogy you can get where you can actually learn how to teach these skills. And the best way to learn how to teach these skills what? Um, there is. I know it exists. I can't. I can't cite you any titles. However, Daniel Blue, who was one of the authors on one of the textbooks I'm going to reference, is at Michigan State University, and his specialty is youth sports psychology. And, and you know what? And keep in mind what Lisa asked was this actual text written for a high schooler. Almost all of the text relative to sports psychology can be applied to that age group, but actually finding stuff written for that age group is a little bit different. But I think that can point you in the right direction because he's written like tons of stuff. It's the lack of knowledge, misunderstanding about mental skills. Um, we talked about some of the myths, and that's where a lot of misunderstandings come from. People just don't realize um, what they are. And let me ask you this, since we've got coaches out here. How many of you have just yelled at your athletes, relax? <laughs> <laughs> How many of you yelled at your athletes, just breathe? <laughs> how many of you yelled at your athletes, concentrate? <laughs> Did you ever teach them how to do it? Did it? What'd you do? How'd you do it? Uh, maybe not think about it. I mean, uh, for concentration? Yeah, concentration okay, you gotta be able to read it. Uh, okay, well, how'd you, how'd you teach them concentration? Huh? Reading, reading, reading games a little bit, you know, concentration plays into that. But here's what I'm, here's what I'm, we'll get into this, and I don't expect you, I don't expect you to have the answer I want, because you would need to be here if you had the answer I want. But my point is relax, concentrate, read. We, our automatic thought processes, those are innate traits that we all should just be able to do that. It's kind of like, it's kind of like when you, when you lost something and you have someone looking for it for you. Look harder! How do you look harder? <laughs> Relaxing, breathing, concentrating are not innate skills. Some people can just naturally do them very well, but they're learned. And they can be learned, and they can be developed, and they can be mastered. And there's methods used within the mental skills training to develop those skills. And there's actually exercises you can go through to develop relaxation techniques, breathing techniques to either energize yourself, calm yourself down, if you have an abnormal high level of arousal for you, you know, the butterflies, if you have a butterfly in your stomach for you, if you're too hyped up. And you know, you hear a lot of those athletes, the first 10 minutes, they just, oh, they're too psyched up and they really can't perform those first 10 minutes to get in the game. Well, there's methods that can be used to counteract that so they don't have to wait 10 minutes in the game to run a while. Here's a good quote. Um, talking about arousal levels, arousal anxiety levels, energy management. So it's not, it's not about the butterflies you have in your stomach. It's about getting them to fly in formation. And what that means is this. Anxiety, anxiety is, is, not, is not intrinsically negative. You have to put a value on anxiety. And what mental skills training can help you do is look at anxiety as a positive emotion, a positive psychosomatic um, process. Because, one, you can actually learn skills bring that arousal level down, imagery, relaxation, and two, you can just simply look through positive self-talk. You can just tell yourself, hey, this is good, I'm ready to be, I'm ready to be, I'm prepared, I'm thinking about it, I care about it. Different things you can do with that. So, you know, a little bit of misunderstanding about mental skills, and we'll get, we'll get to back to concentrate your life a little bit later. I'm not going to teach you the skills in this class. We've got to the, the next level, because that's for the next level of curriculum that we do. We go through the skills there. I hope I'm, we're doing pretty good on time. I'm hoping we can do at least one that I've used with students in the past, and it, it works pretty well. Let's see. 
you actually get a motor response from just going through it in your mind. And then they've done studies where people will shoot 50 free throw, they'll get a baseline of people's free throw uh, capabilities. They'll have a control group that just practices 50 free throws, shoots 50 free throws, and an experimental group that images shooting 50 free throws. Guess who improves more? This kind of gets into the next the, the, the level the level two session of the level three curriculum, but that's a great way. It's a great way to stay in practice during an injury rehabilitation process because you're going through it, and the more you develop those imagery skills, where you can really see, hear, smell, and feel, you're really kind of keeping the muscle memory intact. You're going to lose strength. You're going to lose some coordination. Quiet, you need to try to provide 
an opportunity for them to be quiet. It's not going to be the same for everybody. You can't accommodate five, six, seven, eight different individuals all individually. They have to work with you too. But you have to take into account that when you're dealing with team sports, one size does not fit all. And that's where some of this comes into it. I just want to emphasize what my husband was saying. We have an 18-year-old daughter with cerebral palsy, and when she talks about playing soccer, she says she's had dreams and has visualized herself just playing without her walker or anything. When she actually uses the wheelchair or the walker, she's going with her walker. But she's mentioned several times when she envisions herself playing, she envisions herself without anything. And, you know, she'll actually like, try to move her legs and everything to, to play, which I think is really cool. And she, <laughs> um, pick up a little bit here. Goal setting, that's another one of the methods. And uh, again, I'm going to cover goal setting in detail in this afternoon. So um, you can, if you don't attend that session, you'll be able to get it online. Uh, and once on that, again, you can always call me too. I mean, that's one of the things that Blade Sports does is we're here for technical assistance. Pick up the phone and we're not at our desk. We need to call back and we need to have an online conversation. Attention, concentration, that kind of gets back to focus and awareness, uh, reflection. Um, came up, I think I came up with a unique term the other day as I was thinking about something. I called it a real-time reflection, which uh, in a way, I haven't, I just came up with it. I haven't flushed the whole idea out yet, but it's a little bit different from awareness because when you talk about awareness, um, that's almost preemptive. It's, it's, it's right now, but real-time reflection um, when I was thinking about that concept, that, you know, part of being a, we heard Pat Williams talk about being a leader, and I don't, did he mention reflection? I don't think he did, but reflection is an important part of leadership, being able to sit back, remove yourself from the situation, and evaluate it partially. And I think it's important for athletes and coaches to be able to do that um, very, very dynamically, very dynamically. I don't, there's times where I don't think you want to wait an hour or a day to reflect on a situation, but you almost want to reflect on it sentence by sentence. And make sure that you're communicating properly and, and taking the situation where you want it to go. Um, I think you kind of flush that whole thing out. I think I got some there. <laughs> so these are the different, four different methods, and within these methods, you want to use these methods to develop an array of different uh, mental skills. And Veeley came up with four different categories of mental skills. And the foundation skills are the interpersonal <laughs> resources that are basic mental skills necessary to achieve success. And as you can see, we've got four in there, achievement drive, um, kind of gets the goal achievement theory, and that's the person's orientation to strive for task success, persist in the face of failure, and experience pride in accomplishments. Um, Self-awareness, we just talked about that a little bit. Um, productive thinking, that's synonymous with positive self-talk. How many of you that have ever competed in anything, or even in your jobs, you do something, you start, who's your own, who's your worst critic? Yourself. Well, how healthy is that for enemies? You know, you need to be real, but you need to be positive. And productive thinking and positive self-talk, and part of that is being aware that you're having negative thoughts and stopping them and replacing them with predetermined phrases or words to get you that contract. And that leads into self-confidence a little bit. Uh, performance skills, mental abilities critical to the execution of skills during sport performance. Um, perceptual cognitive skills, that's the, ability, that's the ability to identify and acquire environmental information for integration with existing knowledge such that appropriate responses can be selected and executed. So that's the active, academic way to say what? Read and react to proper cues. We talked about that a couple times already, right? Mm -hmm. Well, right there it is. I mean, if you're in any sport you're playing, even if you're running a marathon, you need to read and react to certain cues, right? Sometimes it's the other runner. Sometimes it's the course. Sometimes it's your body. And that gets back to what? Awareness. Okay? Attentional focus. Um, what type of, what? What types of different things can you focus on within an athletic event? Personal life, you know, all kinds of bad things. You get a phone call you had two hours ago, yeah. money, <laughs> talks, and 
There's a ton of things you can focus on that have nothing to do with that life endeavor, right? And there's a million things you can focus on within that book that have whatever benefits in there. Um, and uh, you can break that down into uh, broad focus and narrow focus um, and the general and specific. So you'd have a narrow specific focus. What would, what's a good example of a narrow specific focus in, in that place? What's that? That would be general specific. Okay. Or, yeah. Narrow specific thing about standing over a golf ball, addressing the golf ball. And sure, you want to what? Yeah. Keep your eye on the ball, right? <laughs> when I keep my eye on the ball, I try to look at one minute. That's a narrow specific focus. Um, energy management, we talked about that. Arousal level, optimum zone, and functioning. <coughs> Next skill category, personal development. And personal development gets into those mental skills that represent significant maturational markers of personal development that allow for high level psychological functioning through clarity of self concept, sense of well being, and sense of relatedness to others. That's kind of neat. Right? That, uh, that encompasses a lot. Um, one of the places that this comes into play, I think, is with professional athletes. If you're a professional athlete, you get to the end of your career, you spent all of your adult life being defined as what? And what aren't you going to be anymore? Well, if you develop proper mental skills to achieve personal development and identity achievement, hopefully what you're doing is realizing that you've got a lot more to offer than just being an athlete. And if you're in a situation where maybe you don't have a whole lot more to offer than being an athlete, you can recognize that and see what other skills you have so you can develop another avenue so that you don't fall into the depression because your life is over because you're not an athlete anymore. Interpersonal competence. Um, there's five dimensions to interpersonal competence. Initiating relationships. Kind of an important sport, especially for coaches. Self-disclosure. Being honest with yourself. Honestly with you. Providing emotional support, asserting displeasure with others' actions. That's uh, kind of gets back to the communication and how we might want to go about doing it. And managing interpersonal conflicts. And then finally, we get into team skills. And those are the collective qualities of the team that are instrumental to an effective team climate and team success. And leadership, we had a great talk about that last night. We talked about communication. Cohesion, what two types of cohesion are there when we talk about groups? whether they're athletic or otherwise. Definitely positive. There's, there's task cohesion, the cohesion that a group can have to the task at hand, and then there's the cohesion of the group itself. And if you have one without the other, you can have problems. But if you have both, you can, you can accomplish some pretty tremendous things. And then team confidence. And that's confidence in each other and confidence in what the team is whole to do. And that, I'm going to do a video about five minutes. Uh, summary, I'm just going to put this up here real quick. Um, I do want to go, I want to do one, I want to do one little exercise with you. Everybody stand up if you are so good. If not, just sit or you have a little room. Get about an arm's length apart from someone you're at. This is just a little awareness exercise that I've done with a couple of my teams. And I think it, I use this to show them, to start to introduce them to the concept of awareness of your body. So what I want you to do is this real quick, just clap your arms. Really easy, right? Now what I want you to do, keep your arms at your side, close your eyes. Just take one deep breath, hold it for a second, let it out. Now I want you to just slowly start to raise both arms, very slowly. And as you do it, I want you to feel all the little muscles you're using to raise those arms. Every little switch. Every little movement. Feel your shoulders pulling those up. Feel your back starts to stretch a little bit. Get your arms 
up the shoulder bones. Raise them up over your head. Feel your clothes stretch over your body. And slowly start to relax. Feel your muscles relaxing. Feel your hands coming back down your sides. Listen on. Comment, and this isn't related to disability sport, but there's been some research that shows that for an able-bodied golf swing, the mechanics of the golf swing are measurably better when there's no golf ball to be hit compared to when there is a golf ball to be hit. That goes to show the power of the golf ball. And there's a local teaching pro here in Atlanta who is arguably the best teaching professional in Atlanta. And occasionally with some of his um, uh, players or, or students, he will either put a golf ball on the tee or put a tissue on the tee. And they may or may not know if there's a golf ball under the tissue. And when they are swinging at the tissue, they have a very good swing. When they're swinging at the ball without the tissue, they don't have a very good swing. They hit lots of slices. And occasionally he'll put the golf ball under the tissue. They think it's just a tissue. They hit the ball and it goes straight. So there's some incredible power that a golf ball possesses that um, can, can command what a human being will actually do physically. And that probably relates to a lot of what Dan was talking about with free throws and various other aspects of sport. One quick story. Um, and I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll present again for until after lunch so we can we want to have more conversation with Ken. But I was uh, told, I read this story or heard it from someone. There was a blind golfer that was out. Yes, people who are blind and visually impaired at all. Um, and he had his, uh, his caddy with him who was assisting him to get him set up and tell him what the shot needed to be, how far he needed to go. And uh, they were gone with the other two, so and, uh, he got the line off and had a shot. He had to carry about 120 yards of water onto a green. So his caddy got him set up, pulls back, gets a beautiful approach, shot on the green, eight feet to the hole, rolls in, and his flight uh, partner, oh, man, that was green. I can't believe you're carrying your water like that. And the uh, you know, visitor's offer, you know, he yells at his cat, he goes, why did you need to know? He says, well, why did you need to know? Any questions? Thank you very much, everybody.